Hey, it's John from the Commander's Brew. Welcome to the new Capenna set review. I'm going to talk about all the cool new legendaries and a few of the cards that aren't legendary, but go good in Commander decks. Here we go. Very excited for this set. It's a three color set. I love any set that's based around three colors at a time because Three color commanders are kind of the sweet spot. We get access to about 60% of the card pool, really more like 70 if you include all the colorless cards, which is very nice. And it's a little bit of restriction, so it points us in a little bit of a direction. New commander gives us five families, each with three legendaries within them. One of them's gonna be mythic, one of them's gonna be rare, one of them's gonna be uncommon. Rarity doesn't often matter for commander players, but I bring it up just to tell you that there's three for each, and the uncommon one's probably better suited to be in the 99. Each family also comes with a brand new mechanic, and I'm going to talk about those mechanics as I get to the cards. So the first family is the Obscura family. They're about the truth, the information. They control it. They manipulate it. They're masters of the long con. You can't go against a family like this because they kind of tell you what the truth even is. You probably know the color combination as Esper. Obscura is led by Rafine, Scheming Seer. Three mana commander, pretty cheap. That means we can probably cast them a couple of times in our life as a commander player during a game. That means we can probably afford to get them out a couple of times with that commander tax, which is nice. One four flying isn't huge. Ward one is something. Uh, I'm glad we're moving away from Hexproof. I personally don't like Hexproof as a mechanic, but Ward 1 is a nice little bit of protection. And this brings us to the mechanic of the set, Connive. And with Rafine, having a big board of attackers make, means we get to connive for X. Most of the connive things just happen as a one-time deal, but basically we're going to draw X cards and then discard X cards. I'm not talking one at a time. I'm talking in whole packages. And for every non-land card we discard, we get to put a plus one, plus one counter on our commander. Pretty cool. That one four flying is starting to look a lot nicer now. I mean, presumably if we've got a nice wide board, we'll be able to maybe draw 10, discard 10. And I can easily think of a kind of deck that wants us to put stuff in the graveyard. This is only positive as far as I'm concerned. The rare is Toulouse Clever Conductor. It's a really weird mana cost. They all kind of work that way. So you can kind of pretend this is a mono blue commander if you want and heavily skew the deck to blue, but you can also kind of add in the black or the white as you see fit. I mean, this seems like a powerful commander. Three one for three is fine, conniving when you enter the battlefield, but all of the discarding kind of goes under Toulouse. Toulouse has to die for this to go back to your hand, though. This is not a when Toulouse leaves the battlefield. So surveilling, looting cycling, all of these things put the cards under to lose. But if someone exiles to lose, we lose them all. You gotta have a sack outlet. And the uncommon is Quaza, Augur of Agonies. Just a simple 3-4 that whenever you draw a card, target opponent loses life and you gain a life. It's not hard to imagine a deck that is built around cycling, conniving, looting, all that kind of stuff. Just basic card draw to just draw a ton of cards over the game. And if you just decide to pick one person, I'm always going to target them with my draining gain. I mean, it's a great way to make an enemy, but it's also a neat way to target a player who's behind a wall of creatures you can't get through. Next up is the Maestros family. You might think of these colors as Grixis. The Maestros are these cool, old-school vampire collectors that pretend they're all into art, but they've just been around for so long that they know exactly how everything works in New Capenna, and they like to use that knowledge to further their game. The family mechanic is Casualty, which is sort of an ability that lets you copy spells. It's a spell-based thing. Illicit Shipment is a good example of a casualty card. It's a five-mana tutor, but it's got casualty three, so you gotta sack a creature with power three or greater to copy the spell. Five-mana tutor a card, not great. Five-mana sack a three-power creature to tutor for two cards. It's looking better, but that's a real cost. I might want that creature. The head of the family is Lord Xander the Collector. I'm not gonna go too deep here because I already did. It's last week's episode. Check it out here. Undoubtedly, though, three very powerful abilities, and a lot of opponents will definitely not want Lord Xander to hit the battlefield, much less die. The second in command is Evelyn the Covetous. Two and those three other weird mana symbols. It really takes the theme of collecting kind of further, because you got Flash, and whenever a vampire enters the battlefield, you exile the top of each player's library with a collection counter on it. We get to play one of those cards every turn, every turn, so we can do instance on our opponent's turns, and it does say play, which means we get access to lands, but I like thinking of this as just a way to kind of mill our opponents. 
we don't have to use those cards and put them back in the economy of the game. We can just keep exiling cards off the top of their libraries as a sort of halfway mill plan. It's hard to mill players. Most people like having stuff to go to their graveyard, so Evelyn's pretty good against that. And the other one is Cormella Glamour Thief. 2-4 with haste, and in the spirit of the spells kind of angle, you can pay a mana to get three mana back for instance and sorceries. So you get net two mana. And whenever Cormella dies, you put a target instant or sorcery back from your graveyard to your hand. Seems good. Hard swallow as a commander, though, to expect them to die more than a couple times, especially if they start at four mana. But again, these uncommon ones are probably fantastic in the 99. And there's the Riveteers. Jund colors. Riveteers are the people who built New Capenna. They worked the steel, they tempered the glass, that sort of thing. Which also means they know the exact place to go to demolish a building if you want to plant some explosives. So don't get on their bad sides. Their family mechanic is Blitz. Blitz is going to remind you a lot like Dash because you can cast the creature for its normal cost or its Blitz cost. They always have some sort of ability when they attack or enter, but if you've been blitzed in, when this creature dies, you get to draw a card. You will have to sacrifice it at the next end step, which is going to be this end step because you cast it before combat, I have to assume. So you'll get that card back no matter what. The good thing is, if you've got another way to sack it for value, you'll still get that card back. And something like Night Clubber doesn't seem too bad to give my opponents minus one, minus one till end of turn. Could clear out a bunch of tokens and utility creatures. Never an ability I'm upset about having. The leader of the Riveteers is Ziatora, the Incinerator. 6-6 six, six Flying Dragon, Demon Dragon that is, which is pretty big. Having the May ability to sack a creature during our end step and doing damage anywhere equal to that creature's power is really promising. We've got red, green, and black in our color identity, and those colors can bring with them massively powered creatures. I'm thinking of all those creatures that just accumulate plus one, plus one tokens as people are playing spells, or perhaps a Malignus where it's just got the power equal to half the highest player's life total. That's a ton of damage somewhere, and we get three treasure tokens when we do it, so there's probably also ways where we can cast something like a White of Precinct 6 and that could end up huge for two mana based on the creatures in graveyards, but flinging that thing and getting three treasures back, that's just profit. We've got Ognis the Dragon's Lash. Fairly simple. 3-3 three, three with haste. Whenever a creature you control with haste attacks, create a tapped treasure token. It doesn't say one or more creatures, which is important, so if we can attack with a board full of haste creatures, we get a ton of treasure tokens. And giving creatures haste, even if they don't need haste, counts. There's a lot of effects that give your whole team haste until end of turn, and sometimes that only matters for the things that came in because everyone's attacking anyway, but no, no, no. Whether or not they could have attacked before, the fact that they have haste gives us a bunch of treasure tokens. Real secret ramp with this deck, I think. And then everybody's favorite substitute teacher, Mr. Orfeo. I think he was my supply teacher once in grade four. Mr. Orfeo, can I go to the washroom? Although... We, as students, were pretty mean to our substitute teachers. I don't think we would have the guts to pretend we were each other under Mr. Orfeo. He's a rhinoceros. Real simple ability. When you attack, double target creature's power until end of turn. This can get ugly. I'm interested in cards that double attack triggers, double triggered abilities entirely. It's hard to compete with Xenogod, though. That's kind of the gold standard for doubling someone's power. But we get black with this one, so maybe that can add some cool things to the deck that we didn't have access to before. The Cabaretti family, the Naya color family, is all about the social aspect. They love holding galas, gatherings, parties, and they want everyone to join. And they never want anyone to leave either. You can have a pretty good standing in the city if you know someone in every circle who's on your side. And their ability is Alliance. It's about going wide. Alliance can be looked at a little bit like Creature Fall. Whenever a creature enters a battlefield under your control, you do this. And different cards have different restrictions, like it only works once or something different happens on the second time. But something like Devilish Valet, having Trample and Haste and just doubling this creature's power every time a creature enters. Commander decks are good at dumping out a ton of tokens at once. So if you can double Devilish Valet's power, I don't know, six or seven times, you're looking at a pretty mean trampling, hasty threat. The head of the house is Jetmere Nexus of Revels. All these abilities stack on top of each other because if you have nine or more creatures under your control, then you also have six or three creatures under your control. So basically, once you hit three, everyone gets plus one, plus one oh vigilance. And if you have up to nine, everyone also gets the trample and the double strike and that plus three, plus oh on everybody. 
those sort of thing can be taken away at an instant. It's not sort of a thing that gets set at any point. So if someone removes your ninth creature somehow, you drop to eight and you lose plus one, plus oh, and double strike. But how many commander decks are just looking to get to nine tokens? No, we're probably going to put out a thousand of them. And I think the six is kind of the most relevant one. The trample, it's a little bit of a built-in automatic overrun that just sits on everybody. A really strong go-wide commander. The second in command has it in her name, Ginny Faye Jetmir's second. Bit of a token replacement thing going here. Whenever we create a token, instead, cr turn them either into 2-2 two, two green cat creature tokens with haste or 3-1 dog creature tokens with vigilance. If I'm able to spew out a ton of tokens, having them all have haste can surprise our opponents kind of out of nowhere. And as a true second, if you've got Jetmir on the battlefield, you're gonna, they're all gonna be swinging with plus two, plus oh, maybe plus three, plus oh, trample, vigilance, double strike. It kind of puts those three one dogs to shame. Sorry, dogs. You're still very good boys. And every party's gotta eat. That's why we've got Rocco Carabetti Caterer. Bit of a tutor on a body. As long as you can afford the three for Rocco's base cost, the X just tutors up any creature, puts it on the battlefield, and then shuffle. Very powerful ability. I'm going to want to look to bounce Rocco back into my hand so I can cast him again and keep getting that tutor value. Last up are the brokers, Bant Colors. They're the lawyers of New Capenna, the rule makers, and the rule breakers, although they would never say they break a rule because they know the rules all too well to know how to get around them, if you know what I mean. And their family leader is Falco Spara, Pact Weaver. And this is a great example of their family mechanic, which is shield counters. So... Falco enters with a shield counter on it, and shield counters are a lot like totem armor in that if you destroy a creature with shield armor, instead you just take off the shield counter. The shield counter also disappears if you do any damage to this creature. It's a bit more fragile than totem armor, but it comes a lot easier. And with Falco, you get to look at the top card of your library at any time. I like that. And you get to cast spells by removing a counter from a creature in addition to paying their other costs. Again, you don't have to remove a shield counter. And as I said before, there are tons of green creatures that just accumulate plus one, plus one counters. We can use those to cast things off the top of our deck. We just got to pay for it. Now, it does say cast, so we are not allowed to play lands off the top of our library. It's an important distinction. We'll have to find another way around that. Rigo, Streetwise Mentor, is second in command here. We got a cat citizen. What a cute little vest he's wearing. Enters with a shield counter and attacking with little creatures, power one or less, draws us cards. And it's with that one or more text, so we don't get to draw per creature attacking. It's for one or more. As a tough sell, I have to admit. We've got other cards like Edric or Toski that draw us way more cards just for having things. But we've got a wider color identity here. Maybe that's worth it. And finally, La Grella, the magpie. She's a little bit like a super banisher priest. Uh, when she enters, you can take away one creature from every player, including yourself. And when La Grella leaves, they all come back to the battlefield. Yours gets a boost of two plus one plus one counters. There might be a world where you only want to do that to your own creatures and not give things back to your opponents, but it's always fine to exile token creatures and just have them vanish from reality. Another example where the cards will probably fit nicely in the 99, but I don't know if I'd want to make her my commander. And the set does give us a few other monocolored legendaries. We've been seeing one Phyrexian per set now for a while, and it was a matter of time before we saw Urobrask. Now this one is far less oppressive than the other one, I think. Haste seems par for the course for Urobrask, and we also get an extra card every turn during our upkeep, but it has to be that impulse way. We got to use it this turn. And it is play, so we do get to do lands this way. And we kind of force our opponents into a similar thing. Their normal draw every turn instead is exiled in impulse fashion. They have to use it that turn. They're allowed to play it, so if it's a land, they can play it. But if it's like a blue deck and they've got a lot of counter spells, you kind of kill the card because they have to cast it this turn or they lose it. It's a little bit oppressive, but not brutally so. Also in red, we have Jaxus the Troublemaker. This is a good card with Blitz, but the key ability is discarding a card and making a token copy of another creature. Basically gives that creature Blitz. We're going to get that card back when the creature dies, so discarding a card isn't really a cost. And as I said, discarding a card is sometimes a benefit for a lot of commander decks. There's a lot of cool creatures in Mono Red that are worth copying. There's already a few decks similar to this, so I think Jaxus might give us a new angle on one of those. Errant Street Artist is a very confusing commander at the beginning until you think about it a little bit one mana flash with defender and haste no 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 but the haste has to be there because we need to be able to use this ability right away 
So cost us one mana and one in a blue to activate. So since it's flash, I mean, I don't think I would want to put this in the command zone because your opponents would see it coming. The value is that for three mana, Errant can come down, use their ability, and copy target spell you control that wasn't cast. You may choose new targets for the copy. Huh? They usually put more reminder text here, but copies of spells were not cast. When you copy a spell, that is different from casting a spell. That's why Storm works. Storm only works when you cast the spell, but all the copies weren't cast, so they don't also storm themselves. Anyway, Errant becomes copies of copies. You don't get the first copy with Errant, but you get a cheap second or third or fourth, tenth copy. And Giada, Font of Hope. This is an angel tribal commander if there ever was one. Comes down cheap, it ramps us in white. So even if I'm not playing with angels, I think I'm running this in a lot of white decks just for the ramp. But each other angel does get bigger based on the number of angels. So heck, I'm happy to have huge army of angels all swinging in with a million counters. Most of them just have vigilance anyway. Sign me up. And every family gets an ascendancy, an enchantment that does something at the end of your turn, at the beginning of your turn, different timings. Broker's Ascendancy is a nice way to pump the team every turn and makes Planeswalkers bigger. It's in the end step, so we can't use that extra loyalty the turn we get it, but it gets us to ultimates a lot faster. I think this is more well-suited in a Super Friends deck. Cabaretti Ascendancy, a little bit of extra draw. Nothing flashy, useful. Maestro's Ascendancy effectively gives all the cards in your graveyard, the instants and sorceries, that is, flashback. That's not bad. You do have to sacrifice a creature to do it, but it's not the casualty mechanic. This time it doesn't matter what power it has, which is nicer. Obscure is a bit of a confusing one. So here's how it works. It starts with no soul counters on it, but you cast a one drop, you get your first soul counter. You cast a two drop, you get your second soul counter. You have to cast the spells in order. But if And every time you do, you get a 2-2 two, two white spirit creature token with flying. That's fine, but if you don't have a one drop in hand, you can't start it. So that is a bit frustrating. The curves just aren't flat like that. Riveteer's Ascendancy, although being the coolest picture as a throwback to that weird construction black and white photo, uh, whenever you sacrifice a creature, a creature comes back from the graveyard. Only once each turn, but that is each turn. All my opponent's turns work that way too. And there's enough creatures that just sacrifice themselves with no other effort that I think you could build a really cool deck that leans on this. And there's also a cycle of charms for every family. These are always going to be instants. And when you cast them, you get your choice of three options. Riveteer's Charm has a nice sack ability that I like because it is the highest mana value. It's not always going to be the thing you want, but at least they can't just chuck a token away. A little bit of impulse draw for three cards. I don't hate that. It's kind of a draw mechanic, which is, I think, key for these charms. There's a lot of times where the other narrow situations aren't appropriate right now, so no problem, I'll turn that into some card draw, but I've also got the option to exile target's graveyard. That's what I'm saying. If you want to exile a graveyard, you really want to exile a graveyard, but if you don't need to, turn them into some cards. Obscura lets us return a little creature from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. If my commander's a little bit small, I'm gonna like that mode. Counter and incinder sorcery is always a nice bonus, and I get to destroy something small as well. I wish there was some sort of draw thing, but these are useful abilities if your deck is built to suit them. Maestro's Charm also gives us a draw ability. We get to pick one out of five off the top. Making each opponent lose three life and you gaining three life seems almost useless to me. And five damage to a creature or planeswalker will probably kill what we care about, but a lot of times it won't. This charm isn't looking so good. Cabaretti Charm notably also lacks a draw mechanic, but we get to do damage to a creature or planeswalker based on the number of creatures we control. The ceiling is way higher than the Maestro's Charm, but the floor is also way lower. A little bit of a mini overrun, which is nice, or make a couple of tokens. Not the worst. Broker's Charm straight up says draw two cards, which I love. We can also destroy an enchantment if that's relevant, or do a little punch with one of your creatures. Another removal spell, but you gotta jump through a few hoops to make it work. And outside of that, there's a couple of other cards I want to highlight that I think are pretty interesting. Boot, Legger's Stash. This card is huge. Lands you control tap to make treasures. I don't have any information for what it's pre-ordering for, but it's got to be pre-ordering for over 30, right? Decks that care about artifacts. Decks that care about sacrificing artifacts. Heck, you can just save your mana if you're kind of a draw-go thing. If you don't need to use it this turn, turn it into treasures. Oof, this card is powerful. 
Angel of Suffering is a neat addition to the game. 5-3 flying for 5 isn't bad, it's going to do some damage, but the key here is that whenever you take damage, instead, you'd mill twice that many cards. I'd want a sack outlet to make sure I don't mill myself out, because that does seem like a possibility, but I can easily build a deck where we love having a nice, juicy graveyard, and our opponents will be incentivized not to attack us, because then we just mill ourselves, which is good. That's a win-win. Gotta bring up Halo Fountain just for the mere fact that it says you win the game, but I think the most important part about this is it's a white card that can just draw a card. You have to have two tapped creatures, but I think having a bunch of tapped creatures is way easier in the world with vehicles. I mean, tapping, untapping 15 of them seems like a tall order. The tapping of the 15 isn't the hard part. It's getting 15 that's the hard part. All you need is one vehicle, though, and the whole team can try to crew the vehicle. I've been on road trips like that. And I want to bring up Sanctuary Warden also because it's a white card that says draw a card. I mean, these are both mythic, so if they think giving white card draw can only exist at mythic, we're going to have a hard time. But still, drawing a card every turn seems good. We have to attack with Sanctuary Warden to do so, but a 5-5 flying seems like it'll have a good attack somewhere on the board. Evolving Door is extremely interesting to me. It's not quite Birthing Pod because you don't get to put the creature out for free. It allows you to cast it, so you have to have the mana for it, but you go up by the number of colors. A one-color creature turns into a two-color creature, turns into a three-color creature. I'm just be curious to explore what kind of chains you can make with this sort of thing. Again, the fact that you can't just cheat out a five-mana ten-drop or something like that. I'm looking at you, Progenitus. That does take things down a little bit. Cemetery Tampering seems like a super cool enchantment. I often just want to mill three cards every turn. That's enough. Period. Print the card, put it in the deck. But we also get Hideaway 5, so once our graveyard gets big enough, we get that spell for free. That's a bonus I'm happy to take. An offer you can't refuse is worth thinking about because it's a one mana counter spell. It only hits instants and sorceries, but very often in a game of Commander, you've got your winning play lined up and then you try to pull the trigger on it. And being able to hold up one blue to stop most of the things that will stop you seems fair. And if you've got room for Swan Song, I think you've got to consider this card too. Public Enemies sounds really fun. I'm going to run this in a lot of decks. You enchant a creature, and then everybody has to attack that player if able. When the enchanted creature dies, I get the card. It's not the enchanted creature's controller. And if I can figure out a way to tap that creature, they can't even chump with it. They'll have to have a sacrifice outlet, or else all of the heat from the table goes towards them until they deal with this. Sticky Fingers costing only one mana, the potential to create some treasures, and it's extremely low cost to put it in the deck, but it does pay us off pretty nicely. And big score, although it's exactly like other cards we've seen before like this, I do think it's worth mentioning that it costs three and a red instead of two red red. So if we have enough cost reducers, the two treasures we make actually profits us mana. I'm always on the lookout for ways to net positive mana, and this is a way that makes it possible. So there you have it. There's all the families, the new legendaries, and some cool new cards for the game. Now, while I was going through these cards, I started to notice something that finally clicked for me. The way they're designing cards now is way more flexible. There's less staples these days. Very few cards just do the thing they say they do for the mana. It always depends on how many creatures you have, or whether or not your graveyard's like this, or whether you also control this. And it puts a little bit of strain on us as commander brewers. Strain's the wrong word. It's creativity. Let's compare Baleful Strix and this new other card. Now we've got an even Hardstabber. On its face, it's very close to Baleful Strix. Two mana flying... And as long as we've got a few cards in the graveyard, it also gets that death touch. It doesn't draw us a card when it enters. It has to die for that to happen. But we also mill two cards, and it also ends up being 3-3 as opposed to a 1-1. It's also not an artifact creature, so that might matter. Again, I'm not trying to say it's the same as Baleful Strix, but that's kind of my point. They'll probably never print another Baleful Strix, and they'll probably never print another creature that's just better on its surface. Draws you two cards for the same mana, something like that. But I don't mind that. I think this is a good way to get way more design out of the cards and, quite frankly, keep the life of the game going much longer. And it makes brewing decks more fun. And that's what we do here. We brew decks. Well, this is a fun set. I'm looking forward to trying out some of these legendaries. Stay tuned for future episodes where I'm going to walk you through how to brew around a bunch of them. And in the meantime, keep being you. World's a better place for it. See ya.